Today we are doing lesson 13, which covers John chapter 21. This chapter takes place somewhere along the banks of the Sea of Tiberias. And a, there we go, there's our point. Um, sea of Tiberias, also called the Sea of Gennesaret or Lake Gennesaret, but more commonly called the Sea of Galilee. Question number one says, name the men present at the Sea of Tiberias, referring to chapter 21, verses 1 and 2. Verse 2 mentions Simon Peter, Tom, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, which would have been James and John. And then John also mentions two other disciples whom he does not identify. This comes out to seven men. The name Nathaniel does not appear in the first three Gospels, but it's commonly believed that Nathaniel and Bartholomew are the same person. Bartholomew is identified as one of the twelve apostles. If I were trying to make the case that they are the same person, here's how I would do it. John mentions Nathaniel twice, and he never mentions Bartholomew at all. Whereas Matthew, Mark, and Luke mention Bartholomew, but never mention Nathaniel. When Matthew, Mark, and Luke list the apostles, all three writers mention Philip and Bartholomew together. If Bartholomew and Nathaniel are the same person, it makes sense that they would be listed together with, or he would be listed together with Philip. In the latter part, here's why. In the latter part of John chapter 1, and you'll recall this, John is introducing some of the men who later became apostles. He first mentions Andrew, and how Andrew brought Simon Peter to Jesus. Both of these men later became apostles. Then he mentions that Philip brought Nathaniel to Jesus. Philip became one of the apostles. Why would he introduce Nathaniel into this particular account if he did not also become an apostle? It's not conclusive, but with the points we've already made, it seems reasonable to me. And when you also consider that in John chapter 21, we see Nathaniel named in the middle of a short list of four apostles. Two apostles mentioned, then Nathaniel, then two other apostles, followed by two unnamed individuals who are just described as disciples. Seems odd to me that Nathaniel would be placed in the middle of a list of apostles if he were not also an apostle. But if Nathaniel was Bartholomew, who was an apostle, then it would all make sense. Question two says, what task were these men occupied with? Referring to verses three and four. Well, they had gone fishing, and they had fished all night, and as on a previous occasion, they had caught nothing. Question three says, what advice did Jesus give to these men? Verses 5 and 6. Again, on, as on the previous occasion, recorded in Luke chapter 5 at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, Jesus instructed them to cast their nets on the other side of the ship. The result was the same. The catch was so great that they were not able to draw it in. Question 4 says, How did Peter know that the one speaking to him was the Lord? Well, I'm not sure if he didn't mean to refer to John instead of Peter, but I'll answer both questions. <clears throat> Verse 7 says, Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon, Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it and plunged into the sea. John probably drew the conclusion that it was the Lord because of the obvious Similarities of the previous account mentioned in Luke chapter 5. But the answer to his question is, Peter knew it was the Lord because John told him it was the Lord. <clears throat> and I'm sure that everything added up once he heard John say that. Question number 5 says, When these men got to the shore, what did they find? <clears throat> well, we're not told if it was miraculously prepared, but the text says in verse 9 that as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. Jesus provided for them as he had done for others during his ministry. 
just as his instructions about casting their net on the other side, followed by the huge catch of fish, just as these were reminders of the miracle Jesus had previously done, seems likely that the fish and loaves of bread having been prepared for them was a reminder of the feeding of the 5,000. Question number six asks or says to describe the conversation between Jesus and Peter, referring to verses 15 through 17. Well, in that text, Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? First time Jesus asked, do you love me more than these? That prompts the question, what is the these that Jesus refers to? There are three possible solutions. One, do you love me more than these other men do? Two, do you love me more than you love these men? Or three, do you love me more than these things, the boats, the fish, etc.? In view of Peter's boastful promise on the night of Jesus' betrayal that he would not deny the Lord like these other men, the first suggestion appears to be the most likely. Do you love me more than these other men love me? Each time Jesus asks the question, Peter answered affirmatively. Then Jesus said, feed my lambs. Or the second time he said, tend my sheep. And after the third time, Jesus said, feed my sheep. Jesus' purpose in addressing it seems to be to assure Peter that he was forgiven for his denials of the Lord and that the Lord still loved him and that Peter could still be useful in the kingdom. Question number seven, what did the Lord reveal to Peter? Verses 18 and 19. Well, John tells us that Jesus indicated the kind of death by which Peter would die. Verses 18 and 19, Jesus says, Truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Verse 19, Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, Follow me. There are a couple of reasons why it is generally believed that Jesus is indicating that Peter would die by crucifixion. First, from contemporary sources, it is said that Peter died by crucifixion. More specifically, it's said that he was crucified upside down. Also, the language that is used supports this idea. The phrase, to stretch out the hands, is used of Jesus' crucifixion in early Christian literature. That's what Jesus says here of Peter. Question 8. What question did Peter ask about one of the other disciples? Referring to verses 20 through 23. Verses 20 and 21 says, Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? As we've noted before, it's commonly believed that uh, John was the one, John the Apostle, John the writer of this gospel, was the disciple whom Jesus loved, the disciple who had leaned back again Jesus, against Jesus at the supper. Operating on the basis that Peter understood the implications in Jesus' statement about Peter's own death, Peter could be wondering if John was going to meet a similar fate. And so he asked, Lord, what about him? Question number nine. What point was John trying to make in the last two verses of this book? Verses 24 and 25. Verse 24 says, This is the disciple, John, writing about himself. This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. It's understood that this gospel, the Gospel of John, was written at a later date than the three synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. That being the case, and in view of the fact that the contents of John's gospel differs significantly from the first three, it seems that John is stressing the authenticity of this letter. It's possible that the phrase, we know, and the statement, we know that his testimony is true, called on others to validate the authenticity of this letter. It's been suggested that they may have signed this letter along with the apostle to verify this eyewitness testimony of John's. 
verse 25 says, Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. In this verse, John merely seems to be using, he's simply using hyperbole, which is what we call overstatement or exaggeration for emphasis. I understand John to be saying that there were so many things that happened, so many miracles, so many teachings of Jesus, that no one could tell them all. Starting this Sunday morning, July 4th, Mike Mansfield will be teaching Sundays and Wednesdays for this entire quarter. He has workbooks available in the auditorium on the front, front pew. The workbook is called Lifelong Zeal, How to Build Lasting Passion for God.